we're playing white. Let's go after him at e4. We're playing a Russian player, DDT. And we're facing the Karakan. Okay. So there are so many good lines uh, that, that we could play against the Karakan. And they range from... And I've, so I talked about some of them yesterday. But um, one... Oh, the Hillbilly attacked. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that's that's a Dikayo special. So um, we could play the Narokan. That could be a possibility. But I don't really want to play that. It's a little bit too cheap. Let's play a Fantasy variation. Now, the Fantasy does not, nearly, does not get nearly enough love because of the reputation that it has. It has a very sort of shoddy reputation, undeservedly, because if you know how to play it, it's a very, very good line, and it's incredibly dangerous. And also, what's more, Karokan players just don't like to face it uh, because of the types of positions that arise. So, h5, wow, I've never seen this move. That is just not a move. That is totally not a move. So what is the idea of the fantasy? Well, the idea is obvious. You're simply trying to maintain your center. You're trying not to yield any control of the center, and you're trying to keep the bishop at bay. See, the problem with the advance is that you allow the light squared bishop to come out to f5. You're trying not to prematurely define the pawn structure. Okay, this guy is probably alpha zero, but that's not going to stop us from playing the way that we want to play. Now, White's scheme of development here is not uh, particularly hard to understand. I mean, we just play knight c3. We develop the bishop generally to e3. And... We can castle either short or long, depending on white's, uh, depending on black's setup. But if he continues in this way, we're probably going to go long, so that we can properly exploit this these shenanigans. Okay, knight f6 is just bad. Oh, what's up? <laughs> Speak of the devil. Speak. Oh man, fighting words, fighting words. Um, don't speak to the supreme leader like that. <laughs> okay, so knight f6 is bad, and when you play. A line like the fantasy, I've talked about this before, you have to be flexible, right? A lot of players, like, they'll play the fantasy and they'll basically say, all right, I'm a fantasy player, I never play e5. I never play e5. And that's a pretty uh, limited and narrow-minded way to be, because then when you do need to play e5, because you're sort of emotionally associated with that line, you're not going to be able to play the moves you need to play. Because the situation is completely different here. The knight on f6 is uh, very vulnerable. So now the move e5 is clearly, this isn't like playing the advance. Black is almost busted here, particularly if he goes knight d7. Knight h7, ugh. This is not the way to play the car. God. Okay, so had he played knight d7, we would have played e6 with a typical gambit. Now, what should we do here? f4 is possible, but we don't need to play that move yet. I think we have a far more precise <laughs> oh my god. Oh my god. He wants me to lose on time. Oh my lands. Hillbilly respect that. Oh, Hillbilly respect. Oh my god. A hundred gifted again by Dikai. What the hell? Oh my god. You are spoiling me, my friend. Crazy stuff. Hundred gifted. Oh my god. What is that? He is the absolute boss. He wants me to lose on time. I shall not lose on time. What should we do here? I still want people to tell me the best move. It's not F4. Thank you. I really appreciate that. You are an absolute hero. Thank you for the 100 gifted. Yeah, we should play bishop d3. We should stop him from coming out to f5. Now he has really nowhere good to put his bishop. And then if we want, we can play f4, knight f3, etc. Wow. That's ridiculous. Thanks again, Dikaio. 100 gifted subs. I am always spoiled by the community. Whew. Okay. Bishop d7. Damn girl is right. All right. So now the time has arrived. Um, now the time has arrived, I think, to figure out where to put this knight. And as many of you guys had suggested, f4, knight f3 is sort of the natural way of continuing our development. It reinforces our center, and we've just got an amazing position here. I mean, look at how passive he is. Also, the pawn on h5 is saying, he goes bishop g4. So there's no need to panic and drop the bishop back to e2. What you need to understand is that not every pin is dangerous. That's an important thing to understand, particularly this pin. 
So we can simply play knight f3 and follow it up with h3. All right, we don't need to modify the way that we play at all. He's making all these moves with the same piece and he's going to pay the price for it. Oh God, queen b6. Okay, so the key question is, can we play h3? Is he preventing us from playing h3? Clearly the, the real question that I'm asking is, um, you know, is do we need to defend the d4 pawn preliminarily? Now I'll teach you guys a really cool trap. So a lot of you are saying yes, because after h3, bishop f3, queen, queen uh, f3, there's queen takes d4. And it is painful to give up your central pawn like that, but you should see the bigger picture here. Just try to understand the extent of the development advantage that you're going to have in the event that he does that. It's gonna be pretty vast. There's no doubt that you're gonna have full compensation for the pawn, un undoubtedly. But uh, there's a very cool idea that you have in such positions. And I'm gonna show you where I learned this idea for the first time. I'm gonna play a move and then I want somebody to decode the idea. I'm gonna play the move A3. And some of you are suggesting it, I'm pretty impressed. It goes E6. Now we're gonna go H3 and we're gonna to pretend to blunder this pawn. Queen takes F3. Oh my God, I blundered the pawn. Let's see if he bites. And the idea of course is to trap the queen and he bites and here comes the queen trap, bishop B3. It works like a charm. Now there's a cool uh, application of this in the Sicilian, which is where I originally kind of learned this idea. Knight g5, okay, so he uh, tries this, but he will not go gentle into that good knight. Now a lot of players out of sort of happiness, you're just gonna grab the knight and say, well, I've won a piece, this is good enough. Don't settle for good enough. Try to find the best possible idea. Do we have to take the knight and let his queen out? Is he actually doing anything with this move? The answer to that question is no. Yeah, queen back to e2 is the simplest, and his queen is still very much trapped. Okay. His queen is still very much trapped. Knight g5, kudos to black for finding this move. That's a nice defensive resource, and this is a very nice way to cap off the speed run for tonight. On <laughs> top of the 100 gifted subs. Okay, yeah, now he'll lose, well, possibly he'll lose the knight. This is where you resign. Well, to quote Mr. Scheibel, exactly. Gotta, gotta finish that, honey, because my voice is really good right now. All that screaming. All right. He started to think, but a little bit too late. He started to think, but a little bit too late. Now he does give up the queen. That's the bet, and then I can come back where, okay, 94. Now what should, let's try to be precise here. It doesn't matter, we're up a damn queen. Jumpy with a five. He ain't done. Damn girl, thank you Jumpy for the five. What should we take with? Should we take with the knight or the bishop? Now, this is actually an instructive point. We should take with the bishop. We should take with the bishop because the square on d6 is a huge weakness. The queen. Yeah, exactly. We should sack it back. And the piece that is best equipped to, uh, to exploit that weakness is the knight. Now, you might look at this and say, well, wait a minute. Doesn't he have a dark squared bishop that, super, that, that defends that square? That doesn't mean the square isn't a weakness. We could still slam a knight onto d6 and that trade would be desirable for us because we're up a queen. Now clearly here we should castle. And that's the bottom line. You should always compare contrast. This knight is much better equipped really to exploit all these weaknesses than a bishop would be. A bishop on e4 would just sort of be biting on granite. All right, so quickly understanding how the position has changed. You can play knight g5 and go after this pawn. You can play knight d6, but the simplest is to do what? Don't, there's one thing that's hanging here. Queen takes a7, yeah, why not? This wins on the spot. Okay. Bishop e7. Now there's many ways to just finish the game straight away. There's one really cool idea. We could put a knight on d6, but guess what? We could also put a rook on d6 using the knight. Uh, and, and I really hope he plays something like f5 and allows us to demonstrate uh, the finale. Even though we're up a queen, I have a really nice idea cooked up. It doesn't quite do it. I'll show you guys after the game. Yeah, one of the ideas was just a double rooks here, double rooks. 
and uh, you know put insurmountable pressure on his knight. I'll show you guys after the game what the idea was. Okay, knight b6. Now in such positions, when you're looking for mate, you're always looking at the squares, right? So the queen is looking at the b7 pawn. That's a potential mating square. There's a move here that just stems naturally from that one observation, which is of course knight to c5 also. As soon as his knight leaves d7, he's relinquished control of certain squares and that's one way that you accelerate your search for checkmate. It's over. He's probably gonna go rook b8 and then he's gonna lose. Okay, he's going to take instead and checkmate on b7. All right, very nice. Let's quickly analyze and then call it a night. Whew. Okay. So, fantasy variation. Uh, this line, again, it doesn't get a lot of love, but I think more people found out about it. Thank you, Callahan, for the prime. More people found out about it when MVL crushed Alexanko in the candidates with this line. Alexanko sort of mixed up his prep. This was played for the first time in 1890, and it was played as early as the 1800s twice. Marozzi played it. Uh, Spielmann played it. So a lot of these early attacking players uh, played F3, which is a pretty big deal because people, you know, in the early 1900s didn't really violate rules like that. So it's pretty impressive. Um, and, okay, like, I won't delve into the theoretical... Um, to a theoretical exploration here. I'll just say that Black's got a bunch of responses that are very much viable. He can play G6. Uh, he can play E6, very solid move. Even the move E5 exists, sort of a counter game. Queen B6 is a modern move that is considered to be one of the best responses, sort of immediately trying to exploit the weaknesses that are created by this move. So if you play the Karakhan, I, I think we'll probably face the fantasy at some point and, and I'll walk you through some of the lines. H5 is certainly not one of them, and knight f6 is certainly not the boss, not the best way to follow up. So had he played knight fd7, we would have definitely gone e6. And there's one very important concept, which is how should you follow this up? Black wants to play e5 and liberate his bishop. So e6 often has a very important follow-up to it. That's just as important as the move itself. This move looks a little bit awkward, but it's nonetheless quite important, and that is the move f4. Yeah, you can also play bishop d3 first, because in this specific case, you're threatening checkmate. But after knight f6, it would be a very good idea to clamp down on the e5 score of the move f4. In addition, you basically have this idea of going knight f3, knight e5. White is basically winning here. I think black is totally paralyzed. Black can barely move. This is crushing. So knight h7, bishop d3. And where did I get this trap? So where did I learn this trap? There, there is a line in the Nidorf, little known line. Um, and, and one day I just like, found out about this and I was like, man, that's kind of a cool, it's kind of a cool idea. Um, and so we were able to apply that here. That's how pattern recognition and that's just how learning works in general. You know, you just, you learn one thing and then another thing and you always got to keep your eyes peeled for chances to apply that knowledge. Okay, so Nidorf with f4, there's a line where after e6, white plays queen out to f3, and black plays queen out to b6. And what move do you think white has? This is one of white's main theoretical moves. Vichy Anand uh, even played this move. Well, and you know, I forget it less than a few days later. a3. a3 is very much possible here. And if we click reference, um, I don't know if you guys will be able to see, but yeah, you can see... Uh, Yep, Anand against Anand against Pologayevsky. Wow, I didn't know Anand played Pologayevsky. That's kind of cool. Yeah, Anand Pologayevsky, and um, you can see this is a pretty popular line. And if Queen takes d4, then Bishop e3 traps the Queen. So this is a direct application of this idea, uh, and it's a direct application of this idea. And he uh, takes the bait. Now you don't want to make it too much of a habit out of playing for traps, but a3 also happens to be a good move. I mean, you want to defend the pawn anyway, so it's a productive move. Wow. Police guard just went like 80 miles an hour. And um, I tell you, this is a good move, but okay. 
So yeah, A3 is a... Another cop just went 80 miles an hour. Okay, Monka S. Yeah, okay. I think we're good. So, uh, the bottom line... Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Run and hide. They're coming for me. They're coming for Black's Queen. So H3 takes, takes Bishop D4 and Bishop E3. <laughs> indeed, indeed. And that traps the Queen and the game is over. The one thing that I wanted to show you guys afterward, just to fast forward to the end is if he played the move f5, white has a very pretty checkmating sequence. White is a very pretty checkmating sequence. Could somebody find it? And then we'll end on that note. It's rook takes c6, sacking the rook. The idea is to open up uh, the queen's control over c6. And now another lobster pincer, knight d6. You've got to take the knight. e takes d6, and mate on c7 is unstoppable. Totally unnecessary, but still quite pretty. I was hoping he would allow us to do that, but he didn't. Oh well, still a nice game. Okay, um, and that's, I think, a pretty good spot to end. It's really late, it's 5.14. Um, that time kind of flew by. But um, thank you everybody, obviously Dikayo, there's 100 gifted subs, that's freaking crazy. And uh, lots of support from Everybody else, always appreciated. So thank you guys. Um, hope you enjoyed. Um, hope you enjoyed all of the games and all of the bullet today. Lots of bullet today. There will be more blitz tomorrow. I might play the title Tuesday, but we'll see. If not, I'll be uh, streaming again in the evening, as per usual. And uh, I'll see you guys later. Thank you so much, everybody. Um, everybody for the support. Have a great night, and I'll, I'll see you guys later. Take care.